Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining the webinar today. And um, we've got a really interesting topic and I think really helpful around practical management um, and a really good um, lineup of speakers. So thank you for joining us today. Um, the topic is how to manage bladder prom problems um, and UTIs remotely. And instead of me introducing, I'll let the panel introduce themselves. Mark. Hello. Um, yes, so my name is Mark Webb. Uh, you're the gur gurus. I'm not. I'm the um, expert patient, I suppose, and I'll be talking about my personal experience. Thank you, Mark. Nidge? Hi, I'm Nidge Mystery. I'm a consultant neurologist, MS specialist in Birmingham. And Colette? Hi, I'm Colette Haslam and I'm the clinical nurse specialist at National Hospital at Queen Square and um, I've been in this job since 1995 so and have seen quite a few patients with MS during that time. Thank you Colette and I'm Ruth Stross, I'm a multiple sclerosis nurse specialist working in Surrey in a community neuro rehab team. So just to let you know our sponsors for the session today are Roche and Celgene and thank you very much to them. So the agenda for today is, um, as, as you've heard from the people that are giving the talks, Mark is going to talk very much about a personal experience. And then Colette, who I'm sure many of you know, um, is going to talk a little bit about bladder dysfunction management options and, um, and then just a, a case study as well. Nidge is going to cover a bit of the data and then, and then a really interesting case presentation covering many years. And then really briefly at the end, I'm just going to talk about a lockdown project, which I had, uh, you know, which started back in, in March. And then at the end, as we've mentioned, questions. So please do keep them coming in. So to start with, I'm going to hand over to Mark. Thank you very much for joining us. Mark um, is head of communications for Shift MS, uh, a, a, which, a group of which we refer many patients and they find it incredibly supportive. So thank you very much for joining us, Mark. Absolute pleasure. Yeah, um, if I could, um, I, I, I'm head of comms for Shift.ms, but I was a member of them and a user of them for, for years before um, actually joining them and, and getting paid to um, be excited about them. And, and if anybody on this uh, webinar isn't suggesting that patients at least try it out, please do. It's, it's a, basically a social network for MSers. So MS Society and MS Trust are much better at giving the factual information. Shift out MS is just for us to chat about, look, I've got this funny tingling little finger, what can I do about it? And there's always somebody on the site who's also got that tingly little finger or strange feet or funny sensation in one eye or whatever. And it also produces great films um, which try and explain MS to MSers and to non-MSers. And um, just finally, I, I shouldn't overplug it, but it's just brilliant. Uh, we have actually just put out a white paper um, about a, a MS's experience in um, during lockdown. Um, try and try and find it if you can. Um, it's on the shift.ms website. If you look at George Peppers or the shift.ms feed on LinkedIn, you'll find it as well. And the highlights were really that uh, one third of MS's um, think they've had worsening symptoms or difficulty managing symptoms during lockdown. Uh, a, four to, a quarter of MS has uh, continued to shield in uh, of their own accord, and that actually includes me. Um, and 48% of MSs, which I think will probably play into this, stated a lack of MS-specific specific guidance or uh, from the government or from public health organisations. 48% half, roughly. So there you go, that's my plug for shift.ms. I'll talk very briefly about my general um, MS history. Um, uh, first hints of MS were 1992. Um, that was pins and needles, bladder, um, and uh, not so long after that, erectile dysfunction. Um, being a bloke, I could ignore them and uh, just carry on as normal. And I also lived in France where you could get your, you could whip your willy out wherever you needed to wee. So uh, for years, I kind of got away with it. And of course it was relapsing, remitting. I was diagnosed in 2007 
prompted really, I think, by drop foot. That was when things started to click. Um, and I've gone on to have pretty much the whole collection of sympt main symptoms. Uh, the one I don't have is any kind of optic neuritis and, and long may that continue. Uh, 2019 ish, I was confirmed. I, it's always that gray area, but um, I, I was confirmed as having secondary progressive. Um, in terms of bladder history, and I know that's the um, where we're going today. Um, I've been, well, as you said, 1992, it started being an issue coming and going. But I've been self catheterizing for around about eight years. Um, never really found that a problem when the MS nurse came. Um, it's quite a psychological barrier. And um, frankly, I, the nurse told me I, 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 she felt I was close to passing out and she nearly aborted. But I did that. And after that, it became very easy. Um, I used pads um, and uh, I was, um, I think I was a good boy in um, cleanliness and everything else I needed to do, but um, I did suffer from uh, regular UTIs and two or three very bad ones. Um, the, the, the impact of a UTI on me is essentially a high fever. Um, and when I have a high fever, my um, spasms go into essentially um, paralysis down the left side to the extent that I need morphine because the pain and the, the intensity of the paralysis is so strong. So um, that led me and, and um, really the fact that with the UTIs and however often um, I, um, I used a self, um, used a self catheterizing, um, I, it just wasn't really enough and I was aware that if I self catheterized more than five or six times a day, it was just going to be more UTIs. So uh, probably just before lockdown, I took the decision um, to investigate suprapubic catheters. Um, and actually, uh, the insertion of a suprapubic catheter happened um, about six, seven weeks ago. So uh, during lockdown, everyone wearing masks and everything, everything else. So in terms of my experience of that, um, I think the continent service that, that, refer, that came and talked to me and then referred to me, um, it all went normally. It didn't feel very lockdowny in any issues. Um, I think the challenges I had was elsewhere, for example, with MS nurses, um, and uh, the GPs under practice, I couldn't have that joined up conversation with other people to just sanity check whether that was wise um, to find out uh, how tough it would be or not, et cetera, et cetera. So although it felt to me while we're, we're all reading in the um, headlines about and there was a headline today about a, a, a chap who died from cancer who who hadn't been um, diagnosed in time because of lockdown. Actually, I had no problem getting processed through the system and having a, an SPC um, inserted. Um, but yeah, I didn't really feel that I could have that support network around me that I might have had um, in any other year but 2020, frankly. Um, my personal challenge really was um, because I am self-isolating by choice I happen to live with a, a nice house big patio to exercise on my wheelchair uh, big garden so I haven't felt particularly challenged by staying isolated but what did happen when I got to hospital it was the first time in a big crowd with lots of masks I've seen the odd delivery man with a mask etc but I hadn't been in the real world for several months I'm not an agoraphobic, I'm not an introvert, anything like that, but I, it really was a challenge. So um, I suspect my, I think my blood pressure was quite high when I was measured and I, I, I would assume that was the reason. It just was a, a different world that I had been just totally separated from in, in that year, 2020. Um, and then after um, the operation, which I didn't enjoy, I, uh, funnily enough, I went for um, local anaesthetic and I, I think I wish I'd gone for general, probably a, 
quite a psychological thing when you know where they're where they're chopping around with their little saw thing. Um, so it was quite a toughie and I probably came out of the operation in shock. Um, but after that, I, I've kind of got used to it. I'm still a little bit tender. Um, and the ongoing worry, I think, um, as with other stuff uh, early on in the lockdown is, am I gonna get the supplies? So I am uh, in regular contact. Uh, it, Coloplast is the company I use to um, get my supplies to me. And um, I have to say I've had, and they're very, I find them very good. Um, but I've had a, um, a little bit of a, a mix of um, different bags coming through. None of them have been a problem, but when you're early on in that journey, um, that's not ideal because you just want you just don't want to have to think about anything more than oh bloody hell i'm going to yank up uh, yank up my belly button again and uh, so that's been a small issue but but it, it's been surmountable um i uh, i reached out on uh, shift.ms to see if there have been any other um ms's who had had any good or bad experiences of um uh, bladder bladder support um funnily enough i didn't get a huge amount of uh, feedback but uh, it can be anonymous shift.ms but probably not the most exciting of com um uh, of subjects but i'll i'll read out a couple of um um negative experiences that i did get so number one i'm frustrated by the impact of the pandemic pandemic i'm on botox injections into my bladder which needs to be repeated every six months or so it was due around Feb, so somewhat overdue now. I do chase every so often, but I feel I'm pissing against the wind, to quote an app saying. Um, so that was one. He did actually follow up. This was about a week ago. He did a follow up a couple of days ago saying, hey, I've actually been contacted now, but still that's seven or eight months late. The other person was due to get ISCT training with a view to receive, receive Botox in March. This was cancelled and no further communication to date. In addition, support appointment from continence nurse, nurse converted to phone appointment, then cancelled, rescheduled for January 2021. Um, so nobody is actually saying anger. I think we all understand why these things are happening. Um, but those are two real time cases of, uh, of what's happened by necessity, by um, you know what what's going on in the world, um, but I bet they're not the only ones. If we really uh, dug deeply, so um, my general overview of time in the pandemic is I've personally not had that delayed experience. I would share the frustration with a lack of communication, and because I couldn't talk to all the people I would have liked to sanity check my decision. I feel like I flew into the, um, it, it all happened too quickly for me. It's done now. Hopefully it's for the better. Still getting the hang of it, but such is life. Um, I'm gonna hang around. Um, I don't know if there's any questions come up, but I'll, um, I'll listen in to you clever people, um, but I'll also be uh, around at the end should there be any other questions. Um, and one final plug, um, I try to be as open as I can about all the, the, the grittier stuff about MS. And I have a blog, uh, it's called one man and his catheters.com. And I've just written about my um, SPC uh, experience. I, I'd love you to take a look at it because I try to be open and a little bit silly about my experiences. Thank you, Mark. That's that's really powerful, actually, and really important for us to actually hear that experience. And thank you for getting the feedback from Shift MS, because I think it's good for us to hear that, partly for us to show evidence. A lot of those staff might have been redeployed and actually it should have been, um, you know, obviously the services that you're mentioning are, are really important. Can I just ask you one question? You talk about psychological barriers when you first um, considered the ISC. Is there anything from the from us from from the MS team point of view that we could have done better or differently, or you know, could there have been um, more information or in, any feedback particularly around that? 
Yes, I, th I think possibly more information. I'm I'm somebody who who likes to know what's happening, um, so I can read up about it, you know, via Doctor Google. But Doctor Google is is a dangerous place to to be sometimes. So I would have liked a more detailed description of the procedure and the aftermath. Um, of course, I've been uh, visited by district nurses in, uh, I think, either two or three times in the 10 days following my, um, following the operation. And um, I know in a couple of months, I'll have the, the first, the, the, the catheter whipped out and replaced. So I know I'll get a follow up visit. But I've never had that full on discussion about this is what's going to happen. This is how you'll feel. These are the implications. These are the watch outs. It's just, yeah, let's do it. And I'll book you in. And then and then it came. I'm slightly exaggerating there, but I, I certainly could have had more information. And with the with the um, since you've had the super pubic catheter, would you say the communication with the urology team and your MS team and yourself, how's that been? Non-existent. OK, how do you think we could improve that? Uh, well, I, I've, I've um, bad lucked out in terms of the MS nurses because um, I had recently moved back to the area. So my first MS nurse, so I was renewing acquaintances with um, my local, my Luton and Dunstable Hospital. Um, unfortunately, my first meeting was cancelled because um, of the pandemic. Um, and I haven't been able to, I've got one booked for February, so I haven't ha been able to have that chat. The urologists, I have had no, conversa com no conversation since the operation. So I, again, I'd stress how efficient it was in organising it, but I'd have loved that, a, a bit of a touchy-feely follow-up call. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Mark. I think that's really important for us. Do stick around, please, until the end. Um, I'd like to move on now to Colette Haslam. Thank you, Colette, for joining us today. Um, Colette's got uh, many years experience, as she's mentioned, um, managing patients with bladder and bowel dysfunction. Um, so I'll hand over and Colette is going to cover bladder dysfunction management op options in, in a person with MS. Thanks, Colette. Yeah, thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about it's, it's like a patient's journey today, but this is just to kind of... Um, give examples of what the options are out there and kind of taking Caro as a kind of basis because I have been seeing her for um, many, many, many years. And um, I'm just looking, yeah, so my slides um, coming up just to remind me what I'm talking about. As a continence advisor, I could probably talk about each subject for hours um, on um, as it is, I think, but um, I only have about 15 minutes. So it is a brief overview of what's available, so I think. But I have been um, seeing Carol for, I mean, she's had um, MS for about 30 years. I, I was thinking about how long I had actually knew her for, but she actually remembered me being pregnant and my daughter's now 22. So I have been seeing her for quite a few years now. So when I first um, saw her, it was really for general bladder symptoms. And as her um, condition has progressed, we've kind of looked at the different management options. And I, I suppose from my point of view, I always reiterate to people that, you know, these options are not suitable for everybody. And also not every patient I'll see will require these options. So I think it, it must be individual and it's not, you know, a pathway as such sort of thing. At present, Carol's got a super pubic catheter and um, she also has Botox injections for her um, bladder overactivity. But her one of her main problems is her frequent urinary tract infections, even with the uh, um, super pubic catheter in situ. So I'll look at the next slide. So presenting symptoms initially were the um, urgency and frequency. And um, that's what we tend to see most patients with at the beginning, urgency and frequency. And um, sometimes we'll see somebody um, when they've just seen the MS nurse and they might just want us to touch base with um, somebody, or it might be somebody that's actually, you know, the frequency and their urgency is causing them significant problems. I've put the algorithm in because you've probably seen this algorithm um, in many a book and many um, uh, um, you know, paper that's been written. And certainly we tend to look at it as our kind of baseline for the majority of our patients that Certainly, if somebody presents with urgency and frequency, we would always test for a urinary tract infection 
initially. Um, many of our patients don't realise they have underlying urinary tract infections because of their sensory deficits. So it is really as important that we get that tested at the very beginning. The main thing that if MD takes home from anything today is it's really important to find out what people's post-void residual is. Um, because really most of the treatment options are based on somebody's post-void residual, be it a bladder scan or an in-out catheter. And sometimes we have to do um, frequent bladder scans to ascertain. And that can vary from day to day. It can vary from week to week. And it can also depend if somebody's having a relapse in their um, condition at the time. So we tend to look at the post-void residual depending what we offer. I'm not going to talk about the self-catheterisation in the 100 mils, be it when DTH um, catheterisation at present. So certainly we would always look at the conservative managements first. Um, and I think we really need to get back to basics with an awful lot of our patients, looking at what fluids they drink and what types of fluids that they drink. Um, the majority of our patients will not drink enough because they think the more they drink, the more they have to go to the toilet. And they're used to their urine being dark cloudy, smelly, and again, that's why we need to dipstick their urine. So sometimes it's basic advice on the fluid intake, be it um, water or an awful lot of our patients, the main one they take is coffee, you know, and tea. And a lot of the patients you see will take coffee to get their bowels move, move, um, moving in the morning. And, and I think you've got to be flexible when you're talking to the patients um, and individual people, because you've got to work in what you're suggesting with their daily activities. So certainly we would always look at the fluids that they take and when they take the fluids and when perhaps they have their symptoms at their worst. We always look at patients' bowels as well, because I think a lot of people don't realise that the bowel and the bladder is very much interlinked and how they both um, react to day-to-day -to -day eating, drinking, that type of thing, and perhaps when the bowels are actually moving. So I think so it's really, really important that we do that. Um, we do tend, me personally, I teach basic pelvic floor exercises. I'm not a women's health physiotherapist. So I think we do um, try to teach the basics, but for a lot of our patients, we do have to see perhaps women's health physio. I'm looking at it from a woman's point of view because I'm talking about Carol. But certainly I think for a lot of men out there, there's not many units out there that actually teach men how to do proper pelvic floor exercises. But I think actually for a lot of people we see they don't know where their pelvic floor is and they're not aware of their pelvic floor anymore due to their perhaps their neurological deficits. So it's teaching people how to um, identify what the pelvic floor muscles are and for the help that that might give them and actually reaching the toilet or you know for the frequency and urgency. And there's a lot of um, research out there to see that it does help with frequency and urgency. A lot of the patients that I see at the beginning, and I think Carol um, probably agreed that they'll say to you, well, I go to the toilet, you know, 10, 20 times a day. And when you actually ask them, do they go to the toilet because of their bladder, you know, is their bladder telling them they need to go to the toilet? For the majority of patients, it is just in case. Because I always say, if you've wet yourself once, you'll make sure that you go to the toilet every time you actually see the toilet. And the majority of the patients, and I'm sure most of you'll agree, I'll tell you, that they plan their day or plan any activity outside their house with where the toilets are. And they can actually tell you where the toilets are from one place to another, so I think, and they don't go. And they also won't go past the toilet without actually trying to pass urine, whether they need to or not. I think, you know, I get asked um, the other week there um, doing another webinar, what questionnaires can we give to um, patients? I think, I actually think your best questionnaire is your bladder diary. So giving somebody a bladder diary and actually getting them to fill it out over a couple of days to actually look at what habits that they actually have. And you use you actually use your bladder diary as a basis for any advice that you might be actually giving, um, giving your patient. And it actually gives you something to work on at the beginning. And if you're actually treating your patients with any treatment options, no matter what they are, then you can actually see perhaps in a couple of weeks time, what treatment options have been ben more beneficial for that particular patient. So I think actually, if you give everybody a bladder diary and it gives somebody a focus and it lets them actually see perhaps what bad habits they might actually 
you know, be having. You know, I've seen lots of people that the main drink they have is several cups of coffee or several cans of Coke per day. And it's sometimes it's just re-education and again, what kind of fluids that they can um, they actually drink. So I'll go on to the next slide now. So looking at what kind of medications, I think um, we're going to have maybe mention on medication later on, but certainly from our point of view, um, we talked about um, the algorithm earlier on, looked at um, when do you kind of, you know, teach intermittent catheterization, but really that has a bearing on perhaps what medication you might offer the patient as well. If they've got a high residual volume, you perhaps might not want to start them on an anticholinergic medication um, because that might raise the residual and that's when you're perhaps looking at the self-catheterization as well. But certainly we, um, most patients will start off on an anticholinergic. So you're looking at perhaps um, more old-fashioned the oxybutynin type medication. But again, you're looking at the side effects. It really depends on um, the area that the patient is seen in, what perhaps anticholinergic that they're actually prescribed at the time. So, you know, you might have solifenacin, you can have um, detrusitol. It really depends, but they're all of the same family, if you like. But really, you, the patients need followed up once they've um, had these medications because that can raise their post void residual. And that might be why perhaps they've not been effective or it might change over time. Um, medications that are now given out, perhaps uh, something like mirabegrin as beta-3 antagonists. So some patients might be benefit, benefit from that. And um, certainly we perhaps um, put the two medications together at some um, at times, although perhaps that's not something that's not um, routinely given. The other um, treatment of, uh, if you look at the pathway, they talk about tibial nerve stimulation nowadays. And certainly that's when we um, stimulate the tibial nerve for um, reaction on the um, sacral plexus. And for a lot of patients that can actually benefit and it can help regulate their, um, their symptoms, um, be it before medication. So I was talking about the um, tibial nerve stimulation and the, so the PTNS and TTNS. Certainly from that point of view, um, it's part of the pathway now for many patients and it tends to come into the pathway after medication, but actually some patients, especially nowadays, that are really worried about taking too many tablets might prefer to have percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation prior to having any of the medication. So certainly we'll look at that. However, the, the percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation is a 12-week course of treatment, and that can be quite um, time-consuming for both the hospital and um, the patient. Um, certainly more so during COVID, I've had lots of patients asking me about transcutaneous tibial nerve stimulation, and we are in the process of starting um, certainly that up for an, an awful lot of the patients. So this is something that they can actually use the device at home. And um, we show them how the device works. And that's electrodes that are um, just transcutaneous on the skin instead of having actually percutaneous, which is the needle. And for a lot of patients, actually, they, um, they find that quite effective. And there's been some research to show where, uh, that it's efficacious. Um, is actually, it doesn't matter what you have done, but uh, it's the how you use it and how often that you actually use that. Sorry, I'm just checking my notes just as well. I printed them out for myself. <laughs> um, the next step, perhaps for a lot of the patients, might be intermittent self catheterization. And certainly, when we looked at the um, algorithm, we um, some places um, perhaps might use 100 mils as whether we teach self catheterization catheterization or not. Certainly, um, I think it depends on the patient's symptoms and this, um, it depends on the patient's um, how, um, how they're managing it on a day-to-day uh, -day basis. But if we kind of use 100 mils for teaching intermittent catheterization, there's um, on the slide there, there's some pictures of um, catheters. There's many, many catheters, intermittent catheters out there, and one catheter is not suitable for everybody. And it's really um, from a teaching point of view, it's really getting to know your patient, getting to know their home circumstances, getting to know them, their daily practice, how which catheter you might choose. Also, is 
what some patients are taught with is not what they'll use in five years time so sometimes you'll use pa um, patients will stop self catheterizing because they're not managing the type of catheter they've been originally taught with but certainly there's many catheters out there and for mo the majority of patients we will be able to teach them how to intermittently self catheterize as mark said earlier on um I, I tend to teach all my men sitting down now because I have had men, you know, faint on me in teaching. So I think it's really important that they are people are taught properly and they're followed up significantly and they have somebody to actually, you know, be able to call for advice. And a lot of the companies now are, are very, um, very good at that one. For a lot of patients, if they go on to have um, botulism toxin for their bladder overactivity, um, our, certainly our hospital, our um, protocol is that all patients have to have self, be able to self catheterize before they have um, the Botox injections. So therefore, um, so Botox is um, again a muscle, muscle relaxant and uh, for lots of patients that have um, severe overactivity or urgency or incontinence, they might go and the medication is not sufficient or the PTN, the stimulation is not sufficient, they're going to have Botox injections. And usually that is about roughly twice a year. But, you know, there is a big, big delay. And, you know, our hospital has an equally big delay with um, giving patients the Botox injections at present. And I would say we are quite a few months behind um, for an awful lot of the patients, which is quite unfortunate. But I think it's like any hospital, they're trying their best to catch up. After um, Botox, and sometimes it's not, this pathway is not perhaps for everybody, but certainly some patients might um, have read up about sacral nerve stimulators. And that's when the um, stimulator is actually um, inserted under the skin into the S3 um, spinal um, for all, um, area and this is internalized and it's a bit like a tens machine within the body and a lot of patients might use that now nowadays it wasn't suitable for an awful lot of patients with ms prior to this because um they weren't um, mri compatible but certainly there's new stimulators coming out that perhaps are mri compatible and it might be suitable for um patients with ms in the future and perhaps we will see this be used more often um, perhaps before Botox and things like that. So I think it's a kind of watch the space for that. Um, I've put indwelling catheters and um, suprapubic catheterization at the at the end, mainly because I think there's lots and lots of things that we can offer the patient before we think about indwelling catheter and suprapubic catheter. What I would say is that for some patients, intermittent catheterization, sorry, indwelling catheter and suprapubic catheter is something that actually they, got on, they do get on very well with and they can manage and they actually have a better quality of life managing the bladder with that. Um, again, I've put surgery right at the very end because um, for a lot of people, they don't need diversions, they don't need um, you know, major urological surgery, which is perhaps detrimental to their MS. But there is many patients that have had um, perhaps um, diversions and have got on very, very well with it. So, uh, if we look at Carol now, she is um, wheelchair bound now and um, needs requires to be hoist. She has quite good hand function, so she manages actually to look after her um, super pubic on her own. Um, she's a footfall valve and she manages very well with that. She feels that it actually gives her the control and freedom that she would actually that she desires at this time. Again, her main problem continues to be urinary tract infections, but I'm sure we'll have some open discussion in regard to perhaps the main way of um, managing that. I'll close at this time. Thank you. Thanks, Colette. That was really helpful and really practical ways to help manage our patients. I think later on in the questions, it'd be really good to work out where we can access certain of the of the the ways to manage blood dysfunction that you mentioned. I think that's part of the issue is where do people access um, these, these treatments? Um, so thank you very much, Colette. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Nidge, who's going to do a session on data and a, and a really interesting case presentation. So I'll just do a request control, Ruth, if that's okay. Uh, hopefully this will work. 
So thanks, Ruth. Um, uh, here are my disclosures. Now, um, I'm just going to briefly touch on this data, which shows what a massive um, issue this is on a national scale, if I can go back. The massive issue on a national scale, um, and really uh, what we can see from this data that our very own Ruth Stross and Sue Thomas from Wilmington have compiled from HES data, is that year on year, uh, elective and non-elective admissions for people with MS in England have been going up over 30,000 for the last financial year. And um, that stacks up to a total cost of almost 100 million pounds. And if you lump together UTI, bladder and bowel issues, um, there's significant cost and it's almost a fifth of the uh, emergency admissions. Um, but I won't linger on that because what I want to do is go on to um, a case presentation that shows uh, what a, a massive issue it is on a, on an individual scale. So um, this is uh, a man whose career in MS began well before mine, and um, he was first seen in the uh, MS clinic in Birmingham by my um, senior colleague in, uh, in 2008. And uh, these are excerpts from clinic letters. So my colleague says that um, three weeks, he's been having difficulty walking with a burning um, sensation in his legs. Um, but even about 18 months before this, he was having sensory changes in his hands spread into his arms, September the year before, numbness tingling in his feet. And um, January, his legs got acutely worse, dizziness and unsteadiness after that. And in April of that year, he, um, he was unsteady again. So what you can see is half a dozen relapses in the space of 18 months, but each time he's got residual deficits stacking up, which, which don't actually go away. Um, and interestingly, in his first clinic letter, He's already troubled with frequency, urgency, nocturia. He has to get up four times in the night to wee, and he's somehow already been referred to the um, continence clinic at the QE, even before that first MS clinic appointment. And they'd already suggested he starts intermittent self castorizing once in the evenings. Um, and he's already got sexual dysfunction. He tried Viagra, but unfortunately couldn't tolerate it. So he um, has, uh, lots of signs, but just in a nutshell, he's got uh, bilateral hip flexion weakness, significant spasticity, especially in the right leg already, um, and some gait ataxia. And um, what's apparent is that he's going for another relapse um, during this uh, clinic attendance. So they're going to give him some steroids, um, uh, get some scans, and he needs some DMTs. So this is his uh, original scans. Um, a few brain lesions, but quite a few spinal cord lesions. And the report at the time says that uh, one of those thoracic spinal cord lesions actually enhances. He comes for his MS review appointment, different consultant. And um, the uh, consultant he sees this time notes that there's been uh, problems with speech since two months ago, balance problems a month ago. Um, not sure if this is a relapse, but he thinks it probably is. So he's going to give some steroids again. Um, and he's decided to start with a high dose beta interferon DMT and then he'll review him. So before that re, re um, review appointment, he ends up coming in as an emergency um, admitted to one of the medical wards in the old QE hospital. He hadn't opened his bowels for five days. Um, so he had to be admitted, given a phosphate enema. After that, he opened his bowels three times. But over the weekend of that admission, starts spiking high temperatures and his urine cultured positive for E. coli. And also his chest x-ray showed a left upper lobe pneumonia. So he was treated with antibiotics for that. And it comes to the urology clinic. And uh, the urologist notes that the darifenacin he'd been on led to that constipation, which triggered that admission. Um, so they're going to recommend trospium instead. And um, they're going to book some urodynamic studies. So that will help them decide whether he's a candidate for Botox injections into his bladder. So the urodynamic studies, unsurprisingly, show quite a lot of detrusor overactivity. And after he uh, passes urine, he still has quite a significant residual volume in his bladder of 250 mils. So they say he'll probably do well with Botox injections. They're going to arrange these for uh, September 2009. <laughs> 
and they've warned him that um, the injections will take a couple of weeks to work, but afterwards he'll be reliant on self catheterizing to empty his bladder. But even so, they agreed it would be preferable to the uh, current way he's coping. So he comes for his DMT review. He's been on Rebif 12 months. He's still getting side effects, and I think they're quite bothersome. But um, he's also had a relapse um, on that uh, Rebif. So uh, they had a look at the scans. They thought in the end to carry on with the Rebif and uh, comes to urology clinic. So he had his Botox six months ago, and uh, now he's starting to notice for a week that when he withdraws the catheter, he starts to get a lot of spasms. So he wants some more Botox, thinks it's wearing off, um, which is probably fair enough because it's been six months. And he comes to colorectal clinic. Now this was quite a long letter, um, but the thing that really stood out for me is that um, this man's still working as a manager in his uh, plumbing company. And he's found it really embarrassing, unsurprisingly, if he has episodes of incontinence um, in his clients' homes. And his normal bowel habit is passing a really hard stool once every three or four days. Um, and it's such a strain that sometimes there's blood on the toilet paper mixed in with the stool. Um, he's taking Movicol, which is a double-edged sword, because although it helps make his bowels more regular, it also causes some urgency and urge incontinence. So it's becoming a bit of a struggle. And they've recommended glycerin suppositories, see how it goes. He comes to the DMT clinic, couldn't tolerate rebif in the end, switched to Capaxone. Um, Capaxone is giving some injection site reactions, um, but no relapses so far. Still self catheterizing They note that he's doing it four times a day at the moment. Um, Colorectal clinic, they decide to start floating the idea of ACE, which is anterograde uh, colonic enemas. So that's basically where they take the tip of the appendix and anastomose it to the skin surface, like a kind of stoma. And then that acts as a irrigation portal to put uh, enemas through to trigger evacuation at times that are convenient and empty the bowel that way. Glycerin suppositories have been uh, not very easy for him, um, difficult with control. And still, I think it's just affecting him at work in a massive way. Um, so they suggested he leaves off laxatives for that reason, and you're going to try some microlax enemas instead. And if that doesn't work, phosphate enemas. And then uh, he ends up being seen on the day unit by the MS consultant at the request of the MS nurse, because um, he's having lots of symptoms, still self catheterizing regularly. But for the last two months, his left hand and arm feel weak, numb, and painful. Sounds like he's had another relapse despite the capaxone. Um, so uh, they get a scan and it shows new lesions. Um, and the neurologist notes two episodes in the last six months of relapses despite treatment with Capaxone. So they're gonna escalate his treatment to Thai Sabrine. Uh, comes to colorectal clinic, they're quite happy now. So they just discharge him from clinic. Um, urology clinic now, now he's catheterizing five or six times a day. Despite that, there's still leakage at the end of the day, he needs to get up in the middle of the night. Um, they're going to try some Vesicare to control the bladder overactivity. DMT clinic, they're quite happy with themselves now because he's on Tysabri, he's had two infusions, tolerating it well, no relapses, um, apparently no MS specific related symptoms, but I'm not sure how. And um, they're continuing with Tysabri. Urology clinic, they note that he's had two Botox injections in his bladder now, urodynamics showed the overactivity, he's self catheterizing symptoms are worse, so they're going to list him for more Botox injections in his bladder. So then the MS nurse takes a telephone call, um, he went off his legs over the weekend, GP saw him and found he had a UTI, so he's on antibiotics, symptoms are improving, and the MS nurse liaises with the continence nurse, because actually it turns out he's been having a UTI every three or four weeks. And then the DMT clinic also notes that he's got significant bladder and bowel symptoms. Um, unfortunately, he's had several UTIs. His last infection was just two weeks ago. They are happy that his EDS S score hasn't changed. He's uh, stable on Thai Sabri. They're going to repeat his scans. And then the urology clinic has found that um, he's had three Botox bladder injections. He's worsening nocturia incontinence. He's had recurrent UTIs despite self catheterizing regularly. He's on amoxicillin at the moment. And they've said to him that the next step might be um, surgical, but at the moment he's not keen. So they're just gonna persist with Botox. Nurse call, um, he's had a UTI last week and he had back pain all over. 
he's not feeling well at all and um, he's understandably quite upset so they told him to come to A&E um, where he turned up a few hours later and they diagnosed him with urosepsis. So he was in for 18 days that admission, this was at the end of 2012, raised inflammatory markers, they uh, didn't culture anything in his blood but he responded to antibiotics, urine showed mixed growth so they didn't know what they were treating for and um, urology saw him during that admission. They weren't keen on prophylactic antibiotics um, and uh, they arranged follow-up and more Botox injections. He comes to flexible cystoscopy in the urology clinic. They inject the Botox again, but they think they pro he's probably got a UTI again, so they give him some trimethoprim. And then the nurse clinic, um, his bladder's still an issue. Um, he's having Botox, but he's feeling it's wearing off and it's probably wearing off too soon these days. Uh, it comes to DMT clinic. Um, he's having his Botox. He's seeing the urology team. There doesn't seem to be much for the neurologist. So uh, I think they just carry on with the Thai Sabri. They're happy that he's stable, not having relapses. And then the urology clinic says he's now having to self-castorize five or six times a day. Um, sometimes it's painful. He's feeling like the toxin's wearing off. So they're going to list him for Botox again. And then he ends up coming in um, two days after his Botox injections, which were planned. Uh, A&E thought it was probably just another UTI because the A&E department knows him quite well by now. But um, in the end, he ended up being taken to theatre because he was found to have a necrotic ruptured appendix and he had to have an emergency appendicectomy. Went on antibiotics, started to mobilise again. They took the drain out after four days and he was discharged home. Nurse review says that the MS is stable, but look, he's having lots of problems. He's had a traumatic divorce recently. He's got five children, three grandchildren at that time. His wife left him and she left him with a lot of debt. He hasn't got enough money to buy anywhere to live at the moment. He's going to have to look for somewhere to rent. He needs a letter of support to get into the disabled register. He's going to try and help um, get some housing through that mechanism. He's uh, got an 18-year-old and a 15-year-old child living with him. The 18-year-old has Asperger's, the 15-year-old has haemophilia. He's got a lot on his plate and then comes in via A&E again, um, UTI, uh, treated with IV antibiotics. This time he's got a resistant E. coli UTI um, and uh, Botox is wearing off. Um, he's having to intermittently self catheterize up to 10 times a day, getting lots of infections. Um, the neurology consultant talks to the urology consultant about a prophylactic antibiotic, but the urologist is not keen for various reasons, which we'll see later. Urology clinic, uh, he's having to have antibiotics every three weeks from the GP. Um, when he gets a UTI, he gets pain in both renal angles. Um, so they eventually um, relinquish and say, look, let's just start prophylactic antibiotics, start him on trimethoprim 100 milligrams once a day for the next forever. Uh, comes in via A&E, uh, unwell, cough, sputum, and also foul-smelling urine. Um, treated for pneumonia, tazacin first, and then coamoxiclav improved home again. And then A&E again, um, this time uh, treated with intravenous antibiotics for presumed tonsillitis. DMT clinic is getting worse. His mobility is getting worse, balance, and especially his right leg. The, this was the first time it was mentioned to him that he might be transitioning into secondary progressive MS, despite the Thai Sabri urology clinic. He's catheterizing seven to eight times a day when he's got an infection, four to five times a day otherwise. It looks like the trimethoprim is not working anymore for prophylaxis, so they're going to change his prophylactic antibiotic to nitrofurantoin. A&E again, fever, burning when he wheeze, weakness, just generally unwell, MSU came positive for E. coli, nitrofurantoin, um, he's got an anal fissure with chronic constipation, colorectal follow-up requested. Uh, a &E again, August 17, this time his E. coli UTI is multi-drug resistant. Um, he's discharged on kefalexin for pro prophylaxis after this. So he sees the urology clinic and they have suggested he has a clam ileocystoplasty um, and he's gonna think about it. Uh, so this is a bladder augmentation surgery. So DMT clinic, he's uh, struggling with his catheterization because of um, poor coordination in his left hand. He's left-handed. Um, and he also suspects his walking has been gradually getting worse. Again, it feels like secondary progressive MS. And urodynamics um, find that really um, 
he's uh, he's not got very great uh, bladder function. So they go ahead uh, planning for uh, augmentation cystoplasty using some of his uh, ileum bowel wall to add to the bladder wall. Uh, he's been warned um, that if he has that, um, you know, it's a major undertaking, but uh, he's uh, also got a UTI, so they start him on ciprofloxacin this time. Nurse clinic refers him to rehab again. He's got an FES already, but the main problem now, he's struggling to self catheterize because his left hand is uh, ataxic, um, uh, and he comes to the continence clinic as well yet. Yeah. So um, he's struggling a bit with his current speedy cast. Um, they suggest a Hollister VA Pro, um, which he tries, but um, a month later, uh, when he comes, uh, he wants to revert back to the original brand, um, so they revert him. He has had no relapse of his MS since he started on Tysabri, but his walking has deteriorated anyway, um, and he was made redundant after 25 years service at his company. He's now using a wheelchair more often. Um, he uh, understands he may be transitioning into FPMS. Um, I sort of uh, inherited his follow-up at this stage and suggested to him that uh, if it's becoming clear that Ty Sabri isn't really helping because he's getting worse anyway, uh, we might need to stop it at some point. He comes in to a and &E, um, this time pneumonia and uh, E. coli sepsis, but they didn't know where it was from, probably urine or chest, treated on antibiotics again, um, and this time uh, needed to go on to meropenem eventually, and then it finally improved. Uh, he has his clam ileocystoplasty surgery, July 2019. Post-op, he's got a few complications, a bit of ileus, which resolves. Also, he developed right epididymitis, for which he needed more antibiotics. So um, C. diff, because of all the antibiotics, and then has to go on metronidazole. Um, and then he has his temporary suprapubic removed after the bladder operation. He's got a UTI again, more antibiotics. And then the urology clinic have warned him that because he's got bowel wall augmenting his bladder wall, which secretes mucus, he needs to be really careful about catheterizing regularly and doing bladder washouts. But they've told him that the mucus will settle over a few months. Uh, October 19, another UTI, antibiotics. And they're worried now because he's had C. diff and they know that if they keep giving antibiotics, he might relapse and it has a high relapse rate, C. diff. Um, urology clinic, um, they're very wary of giving him empirical or prophylactic antibiotics now because he's had C. diff in the past, so it's becoming a bit difficult. Urodynamics after the bladder surgery, not ideal. He needs to wee as soon as his bladder holds 300 mils, so uh, less than a can of Coke. And then February, admitted to A&E, treated for a chest or urine infection, IV tazacin, 90% sats on air and quite high temperature. And MS Nurse Clinic is really struggling, um, needing a Zimmer frame, wheelchair most of the time, scooter, electric scooter outdoors. Comes in April, he had a 24-day admission. Um, he needed oxygen to maintain his saturations. Chest x-ray showed right pneumonia, treated with meropenem, started to improve. But then he started to get worse again. And um, while he was in, his chest x-ray then started to show changes of COVID. Um, he's giving Comox for what it's worth. And his COVID swab was positive. Uh, first admission COVID swab was negative. So he caught it in the hospital, I guess. At the time, we didn't know what the risks were with Titabri. So we decided to hold off because he was secondary progressive anyway. Um, and also he was um, complicated that admission with a PE, which might have been because of COVID as well. So he's anticoagulated. May admitted with presumed pyelonephritis, antibiotics again. June, pneumonia, right lower lobe pneumonia. Stayed off the tight sabre in the end, luckily no rebound. And December, this was the current admission. Um, Eurosepsis, treated with antibiotics. Confirmed SPMS agrees we don't need to go back on Tysabri. Still struggling with intermittent self catheterization because um, this far down the line, the mucus is still a problem from that bladder surgery. Uh, and he's still an inpatient, I saw him this morning. So we're desperately looking for a way to avoid another admission. Um, so, look, um, that was a very whistle stop tour, but uh, I think it just uh, illustrates the problems he's had. Thanks. Thanks, Nidge. Thank you very much for that. A very complex case. Really interesting to see it right through from the beginning to now. So thank you very much. This was a, a project that I started back in March as we went into lockdown. Um, it was very much, um, you know, kind of as we were exp 
being told that we needed to keep our, you know, protect the people that we look after with MS and obviously try and find some ways for them to work from home and still encourage self-management. So that's kind of where it came from. It's very much for the people with MS um, that we look after to use at home. And it was for, for people with a suspected UTI or a suspected relapse. Obviously, we'd normally have seen them in the in the unit. Um, these were the reasons that we that I kind of put it together. I've mentioned some of them. We were it was essential we reduced face to face contact. I'd also been a delegate on a, a leadership course uh, and also a previous masterclass, and we had been looking at mapping pathways. And our bladder pathway needed um, a lot of improvement, and so we were really looking at things that we could do anyway. So I guess I was, we were in that space. I won't go through those details because Nid has already mentioned them. So this was just a timeline of what happened. I did get the MS Trust involved and um, very much the, the kind of local team. Our local neurocontinence nurse had retired this year in May, so that made a lot of the management quite difficult. Uh, and then I sent it out very, you know, very fast out, just a few trial packs out to people trying to get it funded. We had to go through stock items. Um, so we sent it out in the post um, in advance for patients that we knew were high risk for admissions to have in case they felt they had symptoms. We sent it out with physio colleagues where patients had relapses because there were some really good joint working examples and patients were being seen really quickly. Um, and uh, yeah, then we reported back. Patients emailed us and to be honest, they probably wrote, you know, people were reporting back a lot better than I feel that sometimes we do. So they were sending emails with all the information we required and then we were acting on that. And obviously out of hours, we were still signposting to out of our services. So this was what was in the kit. It cost all of about four or five pounds. It's meant to be simple, easy um, and cheap. So uh, it was a very kind of, uh, yeah, it was something that was quick to put together. Um, I did get the support from the MS Trust very much about putting the patient information and the instruction sheet together. This was some really encouraging feedback from the from our users, but from the people that we'd sent it out to. And these was initial feedback from the first few packs we sent. Um, so overall, the remote testing is an emphatic thumbs up. I thought that was good. There were some little bits we needed to change in the paperwork, but essentially, I think the people that we, we had sent it out to felt they were much more in control of their MS and how to manage it. And part of the MS, the Leadership Academy that we've been um, that, that we've been discussing is very much uh, in Esther's story. So have a look at that online. It talks about her experience of going to hospital with uh, urine infection and, and other symptoms and how we are suggesting that we, could, we can look towards managing this as a whole team. Um, and that was just my acknowledgement. So I think if we go to questions now. So there's one from Guy. If an anticholinergic at highest dose is no longer so effective, would you normally add mirabegron to it or replace it with mirabegron? What would be the reasoning for doing either or? Now, Nidge or Colette, what would you, who would like to take that? So we would probably in the first instance replace it with, um, replace it with mirabegron. If they still didn't think that was satisfying, we might start them on a, like, bring in the um, anticholinergic gradually, like maybe a five milligram solifenacin or a small dose of um, detrusitol, just to see if it takes the edge off it. So that that tends to be how we would do it rather than put them both, you know, both medications at the one time, we'd probably split it up and then add in something. I think that's, uh, that's right. But I think that the thing I'd like to emphasize is the point Colette made before was that, I'd be very wary of uh, chopping and changing without another um, uh, uh, post-mitrician bladder scan because um, we don't have that facility in the MSDMT clinic and I certainly wouldn't want to make the patient worse rather than better. So we often end up just deferring these decisions to people like Colette. Yeah, could I also bring in there about uh, mirabegron, you know, the side effects of mirabegron, obviously it's not suitable for everybody. Blood pressure's got to be checked on uh, a regular basis. Um, you know, so the majority of patients that I know that have come off it, it's because, you know, they didn't like the palpitations and things like that. So even though it doesn't have the anticholinergic side effects, it does have um, cardiac side effects for, you know, some of the patients and that's what puts them off. Do you have specific guidance for blood pressure monitoring when you when you stop it, when you feel that patients are OK on the treatment? No, what we tend to say is we always if we're prescribing it from the hospital, we always check take their blood pressure first 
if they, if we're asking the GP to prescribe it, we we'll usually say at least every couple of weeks, if not monthly, for the first couple of months to check the blood pressure. Okay, thanks, Colette. I had uh, there was a question for Mark. Do you feel that with your experience, I know we touched a little bit on it earlier, but do you feel with your experiences of the MS teams, is there any particular messages that you want to? There's, there's obviously a lot of people listening that are working in MS. Is there something that, that we can particularly take from from you and and make changes you talked a little bit about the communication about how you felt the psychological impact of starting with an IC I think one of the things I feel although I've been working in MS for a while I don't have collects experience and I do feel that it's it's difficult even an example today I've been talking to someone about the ISC and I can feel the fear in her about making that transition so is there anything else that you feel you could add as to what we could do um yes so uh I think maybe um, some people probably don't want to know all the practical things. So th this was a personal request from me is my processing of changes and developments in, in all my symptoms is I I'd like to know. And I know that might not be all the case for everyone, but I think in terms of adjusting the general communications, um, you talk about my bits and bobs and you've just been talking all of you um, in a very scientific way and that's fine and that's exactly as you should be but I think when dealing with a patient uh, particularly when it's it, it's one it's your, your bits which are, you're, you're fairly loyal to um, but it, it but it's also um, stigmatized mm. and I think a little tweak towards being more empathetic and more human uh, would help. I've had, I, I can count very few bad MS experts in the various fields that I've dealt with, but most of them could still just sneak in the extra couple of psychological supports or warnings about what might happen because, you know, all those bits down there, pooing yourself, weeing yourself, whatever I've, I've heard about there, it's horrible. And, and I don't th I, I, I think you need to slightly disconnect from your scientific view when you're with a patient. Yeah. That would be my take. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good reminder. Thanks, Mark. I do think we, we talk about it and we need to remember that. Um, there's a good question from Paula. Um, Colette, after a 12 week course of PTNS and TTNS, <laughs> do patients return for further treatment? And if so, how soon after? Um, do any of your patients fund the device? And I've got a question on top of that. Do Where do we go? Apart from yourself, do you know other centres that are offering okay. this? So from the PTNS point of view, it's usually, it's, most places do 12-week courses of treatment. Some places do eight weeks. We always do 12 weeks to give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, we do use questionnaires and we use the diary and we use um, patients' experience to see whether we actually think it works for them. I mean, there probably is a placebo benefit from it. So we've got to be realistic because it's one of these treatments that if you're going to offer it in a hospital, it kind of escalates and it kind of grow out of um, sometimes, you know, the department won't be able to cope with the numbers. Um, and that's something that we've had to kind of watch what we are doing. And we've actually got extra nursing staff because of it now sort of thing. So it is something, you know, it's, it, hospitals have to watch when they're offering this, this treatment. So it really depends on questionnaires and um, diary, whether we think it's been effective with the patient or not. Then from our point of view, we, um, be, again, because we can't offer any more, we allow patients to come back at six weekly intervals. Now, some will be six, some it's very self-reporting, some might be eight weeks. We even get some patients on three monthly returns to the, um, you know, to the, the department sort of thing so it very much as self when they need it they get a top up and they come back into the hospital for that top up and that's percutaneous so that's the needles obviously there's patients that are now going on to transcutaneous which is the surface electrodes at present patients need to buy their own machine for that and it's not everywhere that's actually offering that just now because it's very new for most hospitals um Certainly, we are looking at looking at putting packages that we hope people um, they'll will be able to give the patients their machine. So some people are buying their own transcutaneous machine, and it's roughly about eighty pound, and it's very much trial and error for that. Um, the percutaneous um, machine is usually um, 
a what's called uroplasty machine. There is various units throughout the country that carry that out, and um, it's not in every hospital, and it's certainly not in every service. And um, there is a um, the company are aware of who carries this out because sometimes it's done for the bowel as well, um, and it can be done in gynaecology. So um, usually that's how the patients ask, um, access the percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. So um, yeah, it's just finding out who actually carries it out. But, I, but because it's a 12-week course of treatment, it's quite time-consuming for everybody, really. Yeah, okay, thanks yeah. for that. And I'm just conscious of the time. So just in summary, Nidge, do you have any sort of a 30-second, a minute, any kind of final co thoughts or comments? Well, it, I think it's probably something that Mark probably has been on the receiving end of, and maybe he could chip in. But what's apparent to me is that we often just sit in the DMT clinics patting ourselves on the back that your MS is relapse free or your scan stable, but that's not the major issue, is it? Day to day, it's these bladder and bowel symptoms that's just having such a major impact on your life, sometimes more than anything else. Um, yeah. yeah, well, thank you, because in, in a sense there, I, I don't need to chip in because you've just said it for me. Um, gosh, in competition for what, what symptoms are mine are worse, um, that's going to be up there, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's just so debilitating. Um, and uh, I, I remember one of my MS nurses saying how, how so much has advanced in, in, in treatments of so many symptoms and of, of course the DMTs and whatever else, but he felt that um, continence was a little, had a long way to go still. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, Colette, do you have any other final thoughts? Well, I think the main thing is not giving up on self catheterization or types of catheters because if you get a good continence service or a good continence nurse, you know, they'll have cupboards full of catheters and it's giving people time to learn, you know, and always having good follow up and arranging follow up because at the end of the day, sometimes I see somebody once. Sometimes I'll see them, you know, a whole year, you know, every couple of weeks to teach them. So I know it depends where you are in the country, what access you've got, but I think it's finding the good access. There's no getting away from it. Intermittent catheterization is all about good teaching and good follow up. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And Paula's just put a comment on that. So Paula Coles, the uh, MS nurse that I sent out the kits to, and she's had good feedback. Um, and just linking in with the GP. And I think that's a good reminder that this is about self-management really mm -hmm. and ensuring that we educate our patients to be able to take this on. So I just want to say thank you very much to the panel. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you everyone who's listening. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder, there are further Neurology Academy webinars. Please do look online. I believe there's one coming up in January. Um, any questions that were not answered now will be answered and, and put online and this will be available as a video quite shortly. So thank you very much, everyone, and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.